Good morning and welcome to the Adult Sunday Morning Bible Class for Salem Lutheran Church and School in Afton, Missouri. I'm Joshua Hahn, I'm your second year seminarian, and today we're going to continue the lesson that we've done for the last two weeks, Jesus Family Christmas Tree. Let's start off with a word of prayer. Blessed Lord, you have caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> okay, today we're going to continue the lesson that Pastor Hebner started last week called Son of Scandal. With me today I have John Whitmayer doing the videography and I have Pastor Hebner in the balcony ready to give me any of your questions that you may type in the chat. So please, if you have something to say, a question to ask, go ahead and, and uh, put it in the chat so we can address your, uh, your questions and your comments. Uh, we're going to start off, like I said, with the Son of Scandal. I'm going to begin by reading Matthew chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David the king, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Uh, and so we're going to continue the genealogy in Matthew, and we're focusing again on the women in the, in the genealogy because they are the, um, they are the portions of this uh, this, this sermon, sermon, this Bible study is titled Sons of, uh, my goodness, I'll get to it eventually here. This is called Son of Scandal, and the women being included all by itself is a scandal. The, the New Testament scholar D.A. Carson writes, and I think Pastor may have said this last week, most gen Jewish genealogies did not include women. But more important, the choice of these particular women, instead of such great matriarchs as Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, proves that Matthew was trying to give us something more than merely biological information. So today, uh, last week Pastor addressed uh, Judah and Tamar. Today we're going to address Rahab, Ruth, and the wife of Uriah, Bathsheba. We're going to start off by reading Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And we're not going to be flipping back and forth through our Bibles this week, so I haven't prepared uh, slides for you guys. So if you have your Bibles, please flip over to Joshua chapter 2. That is the sixth book of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. Yeah, Joshua. Had to make sure that's right there. Um, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. <clears throat> and it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me. But I did not know from where they were. I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with stalks of flax that she had laid in order in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. So from this passage, there are a few questions we're going to address. I have them listed here for you. Number one, Rahab is a complicated inclusion in the family tree because she is both sinner and savior. What was scandalous about her inclusion in the family tree? Number two, 
And this one I actually had a little bit of problem uh, coming up with on my own. So if you have any, any answers, I would be happy to hear them. Pastor, if you've got anything to say to this one, I'd be happy to hear what you have to say as well when we get to it. Um, how had God used her, used Rahab, to demonstrate his deliverance to Joshua and to the Israelites? And third, how does Rahab point us to the grace of God? So we have a few key points from the passage, Joshua uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And these are the, the points that we're going to sort of look at and help us answer the questions that we just went over. Number one, the men go into the house of a prostitute. Number two, Rahab is a prostitute and a Gentile. Number three, she lies to the messenger of the king several times. And number four, Rahab's confession of faith, which is Rahab's confession of faith, which was the end of what we just read. And that's where we're going to start because the entire chapter is written in light of Rahab's confession of faith. So to, to reread uh, Rahab's confession of faith in chapter 2, verses, verse 11. And as soon as we heard of it, the actions of your God, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. And so throughout the history of Christianity, there's been a question that's been asked, and Rahab sort of points us to that question. She seems to be a believer in Yahweh, in the God of Israel, because she's scared of him. Is that okay? Is it okay to believe in God because you're afraid of his wrath, because you're afraid of condemnation? Shouldn't you be a believer because you're thankful for what God has done for you, for the grace of God, for his love, for his mercy? Shouldn't you be sorry for your sins. Uh, during the Reformation, this was, this was a major point of contention. In fact, our Lutheran confessions, the Book of Concord, which is what the Reformers wrote, the, the, the pillars of their faith at the time against the Roman Catholicism, this was one of the questions that, that they addressed at that time. And I want to start off by having you think about Proverbs 9.10. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So, when you, when you look at it in that light, fear of the Lord, and, and this, is, this is not just a uh, like fear of your father, you know he loves you and, and that he will always care for you, but it's also true fear, fear of wrath, fear of punishment, fear of condemnation. That's the beginning of wisdom. And in the confessions, the, the reformers address this issue, fear of God versus sorrow for sins, and which one is true faith. And the reformers in the, in the Book of Concord, in the Apology to the Augsburg Confession, which most of you I'm sure haven't read, but is, is, is part of what we as Lutherans believe, the reformers say, we dismiss those idle and endless discussions about whether we are sorry because we love God or because we fear punishment. In other words, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you are afraid of God and therefore believe in him. It doesn't matter whether you fear his punishment or whether you're sorry for your sins. In the end, it all amounts to the, the fact that you need Jesus, that you need a savior. And this is Rahab's confession of faith. Her fear of destruction, her fear of punishment begets hope in the one thing that can prevent that punishment. Rahab's faith grows out of her fear because the one thing that can prevent the wrath of God is the grace of God. And so through this fear, Rahab is, as far as we can tell, the only person in Jericho who actually becomes a believer in God. And, and her faith, this is a, a tenacious faith, and it, it clings to God. It, it, it clings to God out of fear, but it also begets hope. It begets love of God because he's the one that saves you. And the gospel takes many forms. And here we see in Rahab, it's starting the law, the law making room for the gospel to take shape. The law, the fear of punishment, has Rahab cling onto God as her only hope. And so we see that Rahab, because of her faith in God, acts out that faith in saving these men that come to her. And these men that come to her, they go to the house of a prostitute. And it makes you wonder, it makes you ask the question, why? 
why would they go to the house of a prostitute? And I want to point out that, first of all, it, the text makes very clear that no funny business took place. There was no misdeed. There was no lust. There was none of that going on. They went to her house. Uh, we, the text doesn't tell us specifically why, but there are some things that we, we can uh, assume that we can, uh, through conjecture, re- some conclusions that we can reach through conjecture. Um, her house probably functioned sort of as a tavern. It was a place where people from all over the region would gather. They would exchange stories and information. So it's kind of a natural place for anybody who's coming into town to go. Uh, her house was also built into the city wall, as we see later in Joshua. Uh, her house is built into the city wall so that if they needed to escape, which they did, they would have an easy way of getting out of the city. And lastly, and most importantly, Rahab is a believer. Why would they not go to the house of a believer? God brought them, and the text doesn't tell us whether they knew Rahab was a believer or not, but God, in his divine providence, brought them into the house of someone who was a believer in this this city of non-believers, the city of people who are hostile, city of people who are hostile to God. They find the one believer in the city and take sanctuary with her there. We have pastor holding the microphone. Yeah, Josh, I was uh, interested in what you were saying about why would they go there, and I think everything you say is spot on. Um, You think about the kind of place that Rahab ran. By its nature, it's geared toward maintaining the anonymity of the clientele, shall we say. If you're trying to sneak into a city and spy it out as they were, it might be a good place to uh, stay undercover. A place like Rahab's tavern or house would probably uh, be a good place to plug into the scuttlebutt on the street. What's really going on if you're trying to gauge uh, movements of soldiers, strength of armaments, and so on. Uh, There are people passing through places like Rahab's that would have that information. Yeah, there might even be soldiers in the tavern itself. They could overhear their conversation, Um, yeah. You know, you start thinking about, for example, um, I was thinking of the, uh, if not certainly the same kind of house, but like in the movie Casablanca, uh, Mm -hmm. everybody's coming to Rick's place because at Rick's place you've got everybody who knows what's going on and you can find out uh, without too much trouble what's happening in the city. So yeah, those are are good points. And, And I think also when you read this text, I come away with the sense that Rahab understood better than anyone in Jericho what was about to happen to their city. And she had referenced, what is it, uh, Sihon and Og. I mean, they knew what had happened to these other kings and nations and people. And Rahab understood that the days of Jericho were numbered. So it is a, a... fortuitous thing that they were there, but as you rightly point out, I think this is God's hand leading them to this woman who is a believer yeah. in Yahweh. Very good. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Agree, 100%. Yeah. The, all of the actions of God through Israel in this region at this time have served s- to send God's message out. And like Pastor said, Rahab is the only one who truly understands what is about to befall Jericho, the power of the Lord God. And so that's why she helps these, these men who come from Joshua, who come from the Israelites, to spy out the land. The next point that we want to talk about is Rahab's uh, vocation, if you will. Uh, the, the text says that uh, Rahab, they went to the house of Rahab the prostitute. And the text doesn't say whether she is still in that vocation or whether she has left it behind. I am of the mind to say that she has left that particular vocation behind and has, uh, the, the, the word of the Lord has grown faith in her and she's no longer doing it, but that's pure conjecture on my part. Uh, I just, when, when, when God grabs a hold of you, your life changes, and I suspect that that happened to Rahab, and that's one reason why she's helping these gentlemen. Not only is she a prostitute, but she's also a Gentile. So we see Rahab as a sinner and a savior, as a sinner and a saint. So I wanted to look at a few passages from the New Testament that speak to this dynamic in Rahab. Hebrews 11.31, by faith Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. James 2.25, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? 
And then in Matthew 21, 32, Jesus is, this doesn't reference Rahab specifically, but I, I, think it, I think it points to the grace of God here. So in, in this encounter, the elders, the chief priests are challenging Jesus and his authority. And Jesus, uh, they, they accuse him of dining with sinners and tax collectors. And Jesus responds, uh, Jesus responds by saying, the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed John the Baptist, and even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe in him. And this is one thing that leads me to believe that, that Rahab probably did change her mind, that she did change her vocation. Uh, the, the power of the Lord has gone out before the armies of Israel. The message of his coming wrath has gone out. The message of, I'm sure, salvation has also gone out to these people, that if they would believe, if they would turn to Yahweh, their God, the God of Israel, that they could also be saved, just like Rahab did. He, her mind was changed, just as Jesus pointed out to the, the Pharisees and the scribes, the elders. The mind of the prostitute was changed so that she became a new person through the faith that God have, had given her. Next we see Rahab lying to the, the messengers of the king. Um, and make no mistake about it, these are lies, right? There's, there's, they, they are lies. They, she does it to save these men who come to her. Uh, and, and scripture, we need to be clear, doesn't endorse the action of every believer. And as Pastor talked about last week, oh, he's got, got something else for us here. Let's, let's keep going. I was going to say about, finish your point, and then I want to jump in on the, the matter of lying and spying. So finish your point, then I'll, I'll comment on something. Yeah, the, scri the scriptures don't condone the action of every believer, but we know that even in this life, in this life, we cannot uh, escape our sinful flesh, that there will be lies. And there will be times when, when Christians, good people, are put in circumstances where they have to make a decision to do sin in this way or sin in this way. And it's sort of the, the lesser of two evils kind of approach, which... I'm not a big fan of, but nevertheless, it does happen sometimes. And so we see Rahab here in a situation that many of us will experience at some point in our lives. And, and this is given to us here so that it can be a comfort to us knowing that, yes, she did lie, but she is forgiven. And Scripture doesn't endorse our every action either. It's not one of those things where, where we can say, you know, I, I don't lie, so I'm better than Rahab. Well, we're not in that situation there. Uh, God, when we sin, we turn to him in repentance. We turn to him for his grace that he gives to us through his son, Jesus. Pastor. There, there's another aspect of this. Again, remember that the two men and Rahab are engaged in the business of spying. Yes. And again, you are, are correct that um, the scripture never endorses lying uh, as a way of life, even little white lies are considered sins against the Eighth Commandment. But there is a sense, say, in a time of warfare, when we uh, run through the doctrine of just warfare, which means defensible acts of violence against others in defense of one's own nation or public safety and so on. And if you carry that through to espionage, um, I think that our uh, theologians would say that, for example, a soldier or a spy who engages in deception uh, is doing so, and is doing so, in defense of one's nation, is not held accountable for sin in the same way that a soldier who takes a life in combat in defense of one's nation uh, serving a justly ordained or rightly ordained government is not guilty of murder. Absolutely. So I, it's, it's, a, it's a funny thing, and it's hard for us who have not lived that lifestyle to understand, but um, people involved in espionage, this goes on, and I don't think that God is going to hold them personally accountable for sins the way that he would hold you and me accountable for overt lies. Yeah, absolutely. You make a point that I was going to come to in oh, just a little okay. bit, but no, we, I was, it was actually the next point, so it's perfect. Okay. Uh, yeah, I used, I used the example of a, uh, an undercover cop, right, who's infiltrating a, a drug ring, the mafia, something along those lines. 
This is something that serves the greater good, that's pro- that, that protects the people they are paid, that they are sworn to protect as well. That, that this is sometimes something that just has to happen in this fallen world. We also had a comment uh, and a question from Art uh, who asks about Rahab. Was this Rahab a uh, temple prostitute? In other words, someone who engaged in this publicly and as part of service of a false god or just a, and this is Art's word, run-of-the-mill lady of the evening. Um, and then he asks if there is not a giant sea creature by this name, the same word in the Hebrew language. I'm going to defer to your expertise on both of those, and uh, if we can't answer them, maybe we can we can do a little more research and get back to Art on that. But any any sense of yeah, I think I can give some insight to both of those. Okay. Um, as far as the the temple prostitute, we don't have anything in the text that tells us whether what whether or not she was. I'm going to lean towards that she wasn't a temple prostitute because in other places in the Bible. If somebody is uh, a temple, like with Tamar, it specifically made the point that she was pretending to be a temple prostitute. I think if Rahab was a temple prostitute, the text would have made that clear. Again, that's just my, my theory. There's nothing in the text anywhere in the, in the research that I did that pointed out one way or the other. Uh, and then as to Rahab, the giant sea creature, I can't remember necessarily if it was a giant sea creature, but I'm pretty sure this is out of the book of Job when God comes to Job in the whirlwind and says, did you, uh, were you there when I created? No, I think he says Leviathan there. I can't remember where in the Bible it is, but yes, there is a giant sea creature somewhere in the Bible that, uh, that is referred to as Rahab. And if, uh, I, I can look that up and maybe I'll, I'll put a comment in the chat later just to, to verify. I know it is mentioned somewhere else, I just can't tell you where off the top of my head. Uh, anything else, Pastor? All right, let's see. Yeah, so uh, getting back to what we said, Rahab and the spies both sin. Neither of their actions are perfect, but it's important to understand, to see these sins in light of the grace of God and the vocation that they've been given in this time, in this place. They are there to bring the city of Jericho to repentance, to uh, clear out the evil in the land so that the Israelites can take it over. And through these vocations, uh, sometimes they have to do some unsavory things, but the grace of God, their faith covers all their sins. And so uh, Rahab saves the spies. She betrays the Canaanites. And in this, this brought to mind uh, Luke 14, 16. Uh, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So Rahab betrays all of her friends. She does save her family. She asks that her family is, is saved in this as well, but she betrays everything that she's known in the city of Jericho, where she is probably grown up. She's been raised. I'm sure she has friends. She has other family members that probably do not come to come to her house when the the Israelites attack uh, and it's it's important to remember here that sometimes you will also be put in these situations where you have to obey God rather than obey men and so that brings us to our questions again what was scandalous about Rahab's inclusion in the family tree to the Jews of the day a woman a woman wouldn't be included. And not only is she a woman, but she's a lady of the night, as Art so eloquently put it. And she's also a Gentile. And at the time, none of these, none of these qualities of a person, all of them actually, I should say, would exclude them from being listed in any, any sort of Jewish genealogy. So her, her inclusion at all is a scandal all by itself to the Jews of this day. But what, what really is scandalous about her inclusion in the family tree for us today? And I would say that there is nothing scandalous about her being included in this family tree. Nothing that's any more scandalous than a man like Abraham who sold his wife to the king of Egypt being included. Nothing more scandalous than David, the adulterer and the murderer being included. Nothing more scandalous than any one of these other sinners being included in the family tree, and nothing more scandalous than you and me being included 
in the family tree. If you stop and think about it, none of us deserve to be in the family tree of Jesus. But by his grace, by the grace of God, by the saving act of of Jesus, the coming Messiah for Rahab, she was saved. And because of the work of Jesus, the Messiah, we also are saved. Pastor. Our head elder, Mr. Steve Seatman, and he uh, found Isaiah chapter 51 in verse 9. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not thou that didst cut Rahab in pieces, that didst pierce the dragon? There you so go, there a it dragon. Is. There's that sea creature by that same name. There you go. Isaiah 51, uh, verse 5. So thank you, Steve. Thank you very much, Steve. Yeah, that's great. And well, there's some that's sort of reminiscent of our, uh, of our Old Testament reading today. Awake, awake. It was, uh, you'll hear that if you haven't yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, moving on to question two. This is the one that I had some problems with coming up with uh, a real solid answer. How had God used Rahab to demonstrate his deliverance to Joshua and the Israelites? Um, it's clear that the name of Yahweh, that the God of Israel, is already known to the people of Canaan. And Rahab tells the spies that she knows that the land already, already belongs to the Israelites. So through Rahab, the Israelites and Joshua see that, that even the people who are in the land already know that it's not their land. They know that, that the people who are coming will possess the land in some form uh, uh, after, they, after they're done with it. Pastor, did you have something to yeah, add there? A couple of things. Um, let's finish up what you just mentioned, the name of Yahweh already known to the people of Canaan. You've got to en envision, you know, thousands of people lined up, uh, kind of preparing for battle. And any time you have these great groups of people, there's going to be an intermingling, uh, moving back and forth at a borderland. And so it doesn't surprise us that someone like Rahab, who is... Uh, right down at street level in society in Jericho would be aware of the religious life of the people of Israel and somehow it seems to us has become not only aware of who Yahweh is but has become a believer in him and acknowledges him as her God so that's great uh, we are have comments flying in on Rahab and we've got art again at Job 9 verse 13 um, and he says, you were correct about the citation in Job. Well done, Josh. Uh, Job 9, 13, God will not turn back his anger. Beneath him bowed the helpers of Rahab. And uh, it says in the study note, in the Lutheran study Bible, Rahab, figure borrowed from Babylonian creation myth. She symbolizes God's powerful enemies, which he has defeated. So uh, whether... <laughs> the woman in our text is named after this sea creature. I don't know. Perhaps it's coincidental. But uh, Art is correct that the name at least and the connection with a sea creature are in at least two Bible passages that we found. So well done. We're learning lots today, aren't we? <laughs> Anything else? That's it for now. Keep on going. We've All right. Got, so uh, question three. Forget, How got... does Rahab point us to the grace of God? Yeah. To the grace of God... Um, yeah, a prostitute, the savior of the fighting men of God. We talked about being the son of scandal. Jesus comes from people whose lives are scandalous. We saw that last week. We're seeing that today. I just want to remind you gently that we've still got Ruth and Bath I'm on it, yeah. to cover. So <laughs> watch your time. I'm looking at it. We ought to be. And, and if, if it comes to it, we, I spoke about Bathsheba quite a bit in the in the first week so if if we run a little long on time we may cut Bathsheba a little bit short or I should say the wife of Uriah as Matthew's genealogy refers to her and I did want to give a little plug uh, these books most of the information that I got come out of the Concordia commentary series uh, this if you're if you want some in-depth some in-depth knowledge into these books of the Bible these these books published by Concordia publishing house are just they're gold they're gold if you're if you're looking for a gift for somebody in the ministry maybe your pastor well probably not pastor Hebner because I think he has most of them already but uh, if you're looking for a gift for somebody in the ministry these blue commentary series from Concordia publishing house are are phenomenal 
Um, and if you're looking for in-depth study on your own, also phenomenal. All right, this is going to bring us to Ruth, and we're going to be in the book of Ruth, chapter 4. I'm going to summarize quickly the first three chapters of Ruth here. So in chapter 1, we have Elimelech and his family moving to Moab because times are tough in Israel. However, when they're in Moab, all of the men in the family die. So that leaves Naomi, the wife of Elimelech, Ruth, and Orpah, her, uh, Naomi's now daughters-in-law, without husbands, without any way to provide for themselves. So they decide to move back to Israel. Uh, Orpah does not go with them. Uh, only Ruth and Naomi move to Israel, where Ruth meets Boaz. Uh, Boaz gives her preferential treatment because of her loyalty to Naomi, who is part of Boaz's family. Uh, and he sees, he makes sure that Ruth and Naomi have plenty to eat. And then no, Naomi realizes that Boaz is a, is a close relative and can fulfill the role of kinsman redeemer, which we'll talk about a little bit in a little, uh, which we will talk about in a little bit. Uh, in chapter three, we see Ruth wooing Boaz and the problem of a closer kinsman to Naomi uh, surfacing and having, and uh, Ruth, Boaz, and Naomi having to deal with that situation. So I'm going to read Ruth, chapter 4, verses 1 through 17. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that the presence of the elders, that the parcel of land that belonged to Elimelech, our relative. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, Buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have, brought from the hand, that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilian and Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is, more, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child, laid him on her lap, and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. All right, and so that brings us to some questions that we're going to address in, in this section also. Uh, Ruth is a Gentile living with her mother-in-law, Naomi. Being a Gentile, like the other woman, continues to evidence God's plan of salvation was more than just a family tree. How would God use Ruth to be like Rachel, Leah, and Tamar? Secondly, how is Boaz a type of Christ? And third, how does Ruth point us to the grace of God? Some key points from the section of scripture that we just read. The inheritance of Elimelech. 
is uh, offered to another relative who refuses because of Ruth. Boaz buys the field and becomes the kinsman redeemer. There's the blessing of the elders and the marriage of Boaz and Ruth and the birth of Obed. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about what a kinsman redeemer is and why the closer redeemer refused. And this kind of gets into the minutia of the Bible. It's not something you run across every day. So if you have questions, feel free to ask. I'm going to kind of give you a, a surface level overview of it. So a kinsman redeemer was a system of care that, that was uh, provided in the Torah for those who could not provide for themselves. The closest male relative of the deceased had several duties. Number one is buying back the estate of the closest male relative. And this is the one that we talk about here in the book of Ruth. They also have to buy back an impoverished relative who sold himself to slavery. They receive restitution for a crime if the deceased, uh, because the deceased is unable, obviously because he's dead, to receive that restitution. Uh, they're responsible for avenging the murder of a relative and assist relatives in lawsuits. The one that we're going to focus on is the first one in the list that I talked about, buying back the estate of the closest male relative. And there's another term that we get uh, in the Bible, uh, from the Bible, it's called leverate marriage. And leverate comes from the word, Latin word levere, which means brother-in-law. And it's a system to raise up an heir for the deceased person if he had no male offspring. And we see this in Matthew twenty-two twenty-four, 24, when the scribes and the Pharisees again challenge Jesus. They say to him, uh, teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his mother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. And then they go on with this. I think it's the Sadducees, actually. Uh, the Sadducees go on with this, uh, this scenario of a woman marrying a man. He dies. She marries his brother. He dies. She marries his brother. He dies, and so on and so on. Uh, and so we see that in this scenario, it's the brother that is supposed to provide the heir for, the, for his deceased brother. Uh, and neither Boaz nor the man are brother, brothers-in-law of Naomi or Ruth. So neither of them are actually obligated to marry Ruth or to marry Naomi, who is actually the one who should be the one getting married, but she's beyond childbearing age, so Ruth would be the next in line. Uh, I'm going a little bit faster because we're getting a little low on time. Uh, if you have questions, please, please ask. Uh, the other man re agrees to redeem the land, buy it from Naomi, and provide for Naomi and her family, but then he backs out. Uh, so redeeming the land means that it becomes basically his property. It will increase his wealth, and especially increase his wealth if he's not obligated to sire an heir for the deceased. Because if he sires that heir, that heir then gets the land and gets a portion of the, of the leverates, the, the levires, the brother-in-law, gets a portion of his inheritance as well. So he would be diminishing the inheritance of his children by siring an heir for the deceased man. But like I said, there's no obligation for him to do this. So we see in that exchange there in Ruth chapter 4, that Boaz makes a move. And there's a textual note in the Lutheran Study Bible, which is very interesting, for on, on chapter 4, verse 5. If you look in the notes down, if you have your Lutheran Study Bible, there's an interesting note that says, that, that would render it, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, I will also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. So if the closer kinsman buys the land, and then Boaz marries Ruth and sires an offspring. This textual note, which, which is this, this commentary that I talked about earlier, this is the preferred reading of this commentary. This would mean that not only does the man buy the land from Naomi, but then he loses it as soon as Ruth's heir comes of age. So he, has, he loses everything. He's a, he's, he's a loser all the way around in this situation. He refuses to make that sacrifice that Boaz, is, uh, that Boaz is willing to make. So we see that Elimelech's line had died out. He had no more sons. There was going to be no more in the line of Elimelech until Boaz sacrifices and then resurrects the line of Elimelech. There's this death and resurrection theme here. This family was all but dead. And through Boaz's sacrifice, 
they are brought back to life. Boaz acts according to the spirit of the law in this case. He was under no obligation, legally, according to the Torah, to do this. And yet he takes it a step further. And as a believer, he does what a believer does. He does what a believer should do and provides an heir for Ruth, for Naomi, so that the line of Elimelech is not ended. Um, yeah, so let's move on to, I'm going to skip that part and move on to the blessing Josh? of the elders and the marriage of Boaz and Ruth. But Pastor has Just something. Just a here. real quick comment. Um, you did a fine job of explaining there what Boaz did. Isn't that exactly what our Lord Jesus did for Absolutely. us? Absolutely. Right? Laid down his life for us uh, with no benefit to himself, a lose-lose, you might say. And uh, yet because of him, uh, we are sons and daughters of God, heirs of the kingdom, and so on. You have all of those wonderful New Testament passages that talk about our life as uh, the children of God because of what Jesus did for us. Very Absolutely. Good. So the blessing of the elders and the marriage of Boaz, and we'll talk about that more in a little bit as well, uh, what, what Pastor commented on just there. Uh, the, the blessing of the elders and the marriage of Ruth and Boaz. The elders and the people of the village recognized the sacrifice that Boaz had made. The, the self-sacrifice for the sake of the other, and not just the other, but the foreigner, the Moabite, who is forbidden from coming into the family of the Lord in the first place. Uh, as we talked about a couple weeks ago in Deuteronomy 5, I believe. Uh, but Boaz acts according to the spirit of the law and not the letter of the law. Um, he blesses, they bless Ruth, comparing her to Rachel and Leah, the matriarchs of the, the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's very high praise for a Moabite to be compared to the matriarchs of, of Israel. And then they bless her according to Tamar, who we talked about last week, who Pastor talked about last week, who perpetuated the line of Judah in, in uh, and the line of Judah, Bethlehem is in Judah. And so that's why Tamar is listed here, because through her, all of these people who are in this village uh, can trace their ancestry back to Tamar, back to Rachel, and back to Leah. Uh, and then we see the birth of Obed, a son who is now of the line of Elimelech, but also of the line of Boaz, a son who is the grandfather of David, who is arguably, arguably the most important person in the history of Israel and Judah. So that brings us back to our questions. How would God use Ruth to be like Rachel, Leah, and Tamar? And I think we can point to David. David, the king who, who brought about peace, brought about... Uh, brought the Israelites into the full glory of the promised land, um, who continues the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who through David, our Lord Jesus, through his line, our Lord Jesus is born, Jesus who sits eternally on the throne of David. So Ruth is used, like Rachel, like Leah, like Tamar, to bring God's kingdom to its fullness, not just in this world, but also in the next world. We see the, the grace of God through, uh, through Ruth there. The second question, how is Boaz a type of Christ? And this gets to the, the redeemer and the bridegroom. Boaz is the blood relative of, of Naomi. He redeemed her in Ruth without being obligated to do so. He sacrificed himself. He sacrificed his position in that society out of love for his neighbor, out of love for his family, out of love for Naomi and Ruth. And just like, just like Boaz, or I should say Boaz, just like Christ did, Christ, out of his love, did what he was not obligated to do. Christ took on human flesh. He redeemed Boaz, Ruth, Naomi. He redeemed you and me by sacrificing himself on the cross. And like Boaz, Christ also wedded himself to his church, to his bride. Uh, we are all brought into fellowship as the church with Christ by being the bride of Christ. And just like Boaz looked out for his bride, so also Christ looks out for us, takes care of us, saves us. And how does Ruth point us to the grace of God? It's, it's sacrifice and it's faithfulness. Ruth sacrifices for Naomi. She leaves behind Moab and everything that she knew in, in that country and follows Naomi to Israel where she knew nobody. She leaves behind her old gods, confesses faith in the true God 
of Yahweh. And in his mercy, God brings these outcasts, Naomi and Ruth, who are as good as dead, into his family again through Boaz. They have nothing to offer. All they have is their faith in God. And he, God, brings them to Boaz and through Boaz resurrects their family line. And just like, just like Ruth, just like Naomi, you and I have nothing to offer to God. And yet he brings you into his family through his son Christ, through whose sacrifice uh, you have been saved. And that brings us to the wife of Uriah. I think we're probably, we don't have a whole lot of time here. Um, I'm going to jump to the last slide, the questions to address. I'm going to do, I think I'm going to do this summary here of 2 Samuel 11, and then just jump to the, the questions to address. So several key points from 2 Samuel 11. David should be out fighting with his armies, but he sees a woman bathing on a rooftop. He commits adultery with her, has her husband killed, marries her, and the Lord is pretty upset about all these things. And so some of the questions that we're going to address here. Uh, Bathsheba is a Gentile like the previous three women, but Matthew does not mention her by name. What could be the reason? And though the child, uh, though the child of Bathsheba bore died, this was to punish David for his sin, how from the family tree do we know that God has, does not despise children conceived in sin? And how does Bathsheba point us to the grace of God? And John, I'm just going to skip to slide 14 to answer these questions. Um, so for some reason, Matthew does not mention Bathsheba by name. What could be the reason for that? Not mentioning Bathsheba by name, calling her the wife of Uriah, highlights the sin of David. We see that, that the sinfulness of David, and through that sinfulness, we also see the grace of God. As I said before in our previous, uh, a couple weeks ago, David could be the worst sinner in the Bible, and yet God still uh, gives him faith, calls him by name, and, and saves him from this life. Um, Though the child that Bathsheba bore died, this was to punish David for sin. How from the family tree do we know that God does not despise children conceived in sin? And I think we can point to uh, Perez and Zerah, the two children born uh, to Tamar through the incestuous relationship with Judah. Uh, I mean, if, if, any, if anybody was conceived in sin, they are. But we also have Psalm 51.5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. We are all conceived in sin. This was a psalm written by David. We are all conceived in sin. There's not any person on earth except for Jesus who has been born that was not conceived in sin. So how do we point to the, how from the family tree do we know? You and me. You and me. We're part of this family tree. That's how we know that Jesus did not, or that, that uh, God does not despise children conceived in sin because he has called us through our baptism, to be part of his family as well. And then how does Bathsheba point us to the grace of God? Repentance. David is a sinner. David is a sinner, and yet he repents of his sin. Nathan comes to him and he says, Against the Lord have I sinned. And through that repentance, through that repentance, David confesses his faith in the coming Messiah. He confesses his faith in the grace of God. And it's by this faith that David is saved. It's by this faith that you're saved. Uh, we all, you deserve death a thousand times over for the things you've done, for the things that you haven't done. And yet the word of God has worked faith in you just like it did for Rahab. Christ has redeemed you and brought you into his family. He has brought you to be a member of the bride of, uh, of his, a member of his bride, the church. Um, despite the countless sins that you've committed, you are part of the family of Christ. You are part of his family Christmas tree. And I think we can thank God for all of that. Well, we're one minute away from ending, so I think we should probably close up with prayer unless there are any final questions or comments that we have. All right, if you do have any questions or comments, feel free to put them down. I'll check a little bit later today, and if I, uh, if I find something, or if I see something, I'll... I'll I'll respond to it. But let us close with prayer. Gracious and almighty God, Heavenly Father, 
Lord, we thank you for the inclusion, for our inclusion into your family tree. By the sacrifice of Christ, you have brought us to be a member of your church. You have wedded us to your son, whose sacrifice on the cross, whose blood has paid for all of our sins. And by our baptism, you have adopted us into your family as your children. You have resurrected us from death into life that we may live eternally with you in paradise. Lord, we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week.